Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you all for all of you showing up for this, this brown bag lunch today. This is a wonderful turnout. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Jared, and I'm the curator here at the Amelia Island Museum of History. And before we get started today, I'd like to ask that we all silence or turn off our cell phones so we can avoid any interruptions while our speaker is presenting. Before we begin, I do have a few quick announcements about upcoming events happening at the museum I thought you would all like to know. Next week, we have two special events to celebrate Black History Month here on Amelia Island. Next Thursday evening, we'll be having a very special guest speaker, Miss Perry Francis, join us to speak about her family story and to offer a matriarchal look at our local <laughs> history. Mrs. Francis is a descendant of A.L. Lewis, the founder of American Beach, as well as Anna Kingsley. You may also recognize Ms. Francis from our introduction video about American Beach downstairs in the exhibits. So please join us next Thursday at 6 p.m. to learn more. And if Thursday doesn't work for you, or one day just isn't enough, you're in luck. Because next Friday, we have our third on third lecture, presented by Adrian Burke and Ennis Davis of the Community Planning Collaborative out in Jacksonville. They've been working with American Beach residents since early last year, to plan the restoration of Evans Rendezvous, a music venue once known as the heartbeat of American Beach. Um, on the evening of next Friday, February 16th, they'll join us to share those plans and discuss the future of Evans Rendezvous. This will be a great opportunity to hear about preservation works happening on our island and in our community. So join us then for next Friday at 6 p.m. to learn more. Now finally, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. Miss Margaret Newton is a longtime docent at the museum and is one of the great storytellers we are very lucky to work with here. When discussing who could best tell the second chapter in the history of Amelia Island, or in this case, the Isle of Delmai's history, Margaret's passion for the high drama of kings, pirates, hurricanes, and religious conflict during the French period made that choice clear. I don't want to take up too much of your time, so without any more delay, please join me in welcoming Margaret Newton. all the people that are here want you to do well. So if you see me take a deep breath, know that that is what's being repeated in the back. <laughs> and that you're not my competitors. Right? Right, Eileen? That's right. <laughs> okay, so we are here to talk about the French period. It was a brief period. Someone mentioned to me earlier today, and can you all hear me? Because I can talk louder. It just gets screechier. <laughs> um, <laughs> how can you talk about the French period? It's so short, you won't have enough content for an hour. And I said, ah, ha, ha. <laughs> I like soap operas. And this is a good one. This is a good one. So this is my favorite flag. I give a docent tour every Friday at 11 o'clock. Most Fridays at 11 o'clock in the morning. Send your friends when they come in from out of town. And my favorite flag really is this flag. It always has been intriguing to me. And I think because I'd never heard this story. And this story made me turn into someone who didn't really care much for history because of all the dates, into someone who can't get enough of history. So I am your neighbor. I live here on the island. And I'm just in love with these stories. Um, as we mentioned earlier, as Jarrett mentioned earlier, the reason I really like this story is because where else are you going to get this high drama? It involves royalty, names we all know. It involves religion, reformation sweeping across Christendom. And I can use the word Christendom, and it doesn't sound weird. Um, pirates, conquistadors, fights out on the open seas, massacres, surrender, revenge plots, and recounts that have been retold so many times they are now legends and a lot of them aren't true. <laughs> and it's lasted for more than 450 years. Where has that happened? But our little corner of the world right here, in what they refer to as La Floride, not La Florida, La Floride. So, and by the way, I don't speak much French, so you will be able to follow along with the little I know. So that's our talk today. You guys ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, technology. Forward. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so 
in today's talk, I'm going to get a chance not just to talk about the big massacre. Who's been to a docent tour? You've heard the story about the massacre, right? Okay, not enough, so good thing I am going to tell the story. <laughs> but I get to dive a little bit deeper than that. I get to talk a little bit about the stage that was set prior to the French coming here. Uh, I get to introduce you to the Huguenots a little bit. Uh, I get to explain what was in it for Spain at the time. And I also get to connect the dots for the royalty. This is the soap opera part uh, and key players. And then I get to tell you a really good battle story. Um, we're going to talk a little bit at the end about the facts and the fiction, how lore and legends uh, were created around this story. And then I'll give you some ideas of how to learn some more. So that will fill up our hour. With that, I want you to put on whatever imagination hat you can have, time travel. I want you to go back in time. When this would have been new technology, this map, this would be a brand new world. And I'm sorry for those of you far away, but this is available at the Library of Congress for free public use. So hop on <laughs> and you can get it. But this is a map of the new and most exact description of America in the fourth part of the world in 1562. That is 16 generations ago. I know my dad. I can imagine his dad. I can imagine his dad. I've got to go back to Ireland, but I can imagine his dad. And I can imagine, wait, I can't imagine any more dads beyond that. And I'm only five generations. We're talking 16 generations ago. That is where we are in time. This world was a world of age of exploration and right on the birthplace of the age of colonization. And colonizing was just beginning. But what was happening here on these open seas was basically piracy everywhere because the Spaniards were very good at going out and they were aggressively acquiring wealth, plundering conquering, insert whatever word you want to use. And as they were doing that, the rest of the powers of Europe wanted in on the game, so they started stealing from Spain. And so you might be called a corsair, a buccaneer, a privateer, or a good old-fashioned <coughs> pirate. It just depends on who you give your treasure to. <sighs> okay. So, uh, again, their cell phones weren't working back then very well. They didn't have good coverage, so the pictures didn't make it to the cloud. Yes, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> most of the artwork at the time was artwork based in religion. It wasn't even the, the Dutch haven't, haven't even gone to their genre paintings yet. There are no paintings of people in the fields, really. It, if it weren't for cartographers and artists on these expeditions, we would have pretty much no record of that time. So let's do a more modern map that I might have swiped. Uh, online. Um, but this is depicts the Spanish colonial empire in the age of exploration. You could do hours and hours of talk on just this, how, how they got to this point, but I won't. I just want you to, even from far away, take a look at where my hand is tracing. This is how far Spain would have sailed around the globe to acquire its wealth. And if anyone was a uh, had the benefit at all to see the ship that was in our harbor just not too long ago, they were doing it on small vessels like that all over the world. And what's happening here is this line, this line right here, I'm, I'm pointing my finger for those in the back near the Florida coastline. That happened to be the Spanish treasure fleet. That is the line that they would take. Okay. And Spain was aggressive in its actions mainly, well, one, because they wanted to get wealthy, and we know what happens with wealth, but the other reason is they believed that God had intended them to be the masters of the sea, that God had actually created the Gulf Stream, which allowed ships to sail fast from this area whoo, over to Spain because God wanted them to have the Gulf Stream. So, you know, that worked. <laughs> anyway. So let's go now to this land prior to the French arri arrival. 
As we all know, Ponce de Leon arrives in this land, calls it La Florida, and uh, begins their desire for finding gold. Florida does not have a lot of minerals here, does not have gold, but they sure do give it a heck of a try. And after a number of men and their groups have been killed, died, what have you, for a variety of different reasons, there's great losses in life and investment by the king. Florida uh, is, uh, the king withdraws from Florida. Try no more, no more efforts. And La Florida at this time would have gone almost as far north as Virginia and almost as far west as Texas. So this is a great uh, amount of land even though originally Ponce de Leon only thought it was a little island north of the big land, Puerto Rico. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> the Timucua are here, and they're like, here come the Europeans, there go the Europeans. And uh, they were quite uh, great fighters, and that was part of the reason that the Spanish didn't survive here. However, this is one little tiny portion of the world the world, really, especially as it relates to this story, is happening in Europe. And in Europe, we have religious power conflicts, right? So this is a time, this is where I really started to get excited because I love historical fiction. And um, anything on PBS about Henry VIII and his wives, I'm in. Like, I've seen it. We can talk after if you want to. Um, so religion and politics are intertwined. The indulgences of the kind of leading up to uh, the time period where Martin Luther, we all remember from world history or comparative religions, Martin Luther posts the, uh, the 95 Thesis on the side of a church or on the front door of a church. Big deal. Big, big, big deal in Europe. And John Calvin, that's how we refer to him, Jean Calvin, uh, he brings the Reformation to France because he was studying for the priesthood in Paris at this time. He reads Luther. He's on board. He gets basically thrown out of France because France is not like the Netherlands. They're having none of this. This is not <laughs> Germany. We, are, we must get rid of these heretics. So he, he um, has followers, however, and they're kind of pushed underground followers. They uh, meet in, at night in homes. Uh, and they are the Huguenots. But before we talk about the Huguenots, uh, as you can see right here, this is a familiar face. Because part of that reformation that's happening in Europe adds a little spicy twist by a power grab by this man. Henry VIII's first wife is a Spanish Catholic, Catherine of Aragon. And he wants to divorce her for a variety of reasons, but mainly because he wants a boy. So, and he wants this hot thing called Anne Boleyn, right? So he wants to divorce Catherine. He can't, the church won't let him. So he uses some of the Reformation and the Protestants are, are infiltrating his ears and saying, we can do this on our own. And they pass the act of supremacy and he becomes the head and ruler of the church. That is the Church of England. So, I told you we would get into some very soap opera-ish stuff. So this is what's happening in Europe. The Huguenots themselves actually very successful in keeping alive and, and growing. By 1562, and that's a key year here, 1562, more than 200 million Huguenots are in existence, and they have 2,000 churches. There are many violent civil clashes that break out. You could be attacked at any time. And war is really starting to become a real threat in France. Mm -hmm. Catherine de' Medici, she is the queen, but not of her own right. She is a queen regent, meaning she is acting on behalf of her son. Because her son was put into office. I'm sorry, that sounded very political. <laughs> very modern day. He was, what is it called when they're put to the throne? They're uh, crowned. He was crowned. Yeah, what, what happened? You can, you can educate me later. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm um, forgetting the word. But he was crowned at the age of 10 or earlier, and he was too young to be a real king. And his mom took care of business. She was kind of a helicopter parent. And she, <laughs> she helped him out, even though by the time this happened, he was 13, and he could have made his own decisions, um, but he deferred to her. She, had another, she, had, she wanted a safe place for her sons to grow up, she wanted peace in France. 
she really did not like the war that's happening, um, the violent civil clashes that are happening and the, uh, the prospect of war in her own land. So, she wants some new ideas. She wants some options. 1562. She has a nobleman named Gaspar de Coligny. He has an idea. And he has her trusted here. He is trusted by her. A place in her court. He has her here. <coughs> so if anybody's read a good historical fiction book or you've seen a good movie, this is the scene where they whoop, shut the big dark door. They walk in. It's just he and her. I'm making all this up, but this is fun. <laughs> and he says, and I wish I could do a French accent. And he says, your majesty, I have an idea. What if, <clears throat> treasure, fleet, treasure fleets, treasure fleets, what if we could have us, the Huguenots, he was a Huguenot, serve you. We could go and create a colony in a place that could keep an eye on all of that Spanish treasure. And that treasure could be acquired for the glory of France. It could be a commercial endeavor. And we could resolve the issue of the Huguenots needing a place to escape civil persecution and war. So she said, yeah, sounds good. Let's do it. So that is exactly because of these brown lines that are depicted here why they headed over. It really was a commercial endeavor. So Entre Ribot. Jean Ribot. Jean Ribot is known for being a great seaman, a voyager, a privateer. Uh, I would imagine when he walked into a room, everybody hushed. He probably had a great personality. He had, certainly is depicted in a lot of imagery as being a, this great man. And um, he's a Huguenot. So, of course, he's ideal, right? And so Coligny selects him and appoints Rene de Lagner as second in command. It is a commercial voyage, as I mentioned, and they want to take some of that gold. So they sail out in February of 1562, armed with a flotilla, or an armed flotilla, I should say, and 150 men leave France. Mm -hmm. They arrive at the Riviere de May, River of May, on May 1st. And they name it River of May. Very clever naming. Uh, <laughs> The intention really was to mark the territory of what would become New France. New France needed an air, a marker from the, bottom, from the south to the north of that, that area they were going to declare as France. And so they put a, um, a pillar of some sort that marked this land. And they, award, or, um, they said they marked this land in the name of Charles IX. And then they gave a prayer and thanks to God for allowing them to make it safely to this land, La Floride. So what do they do? They get in their ships and they keep going. They go north. They make it up to an area that nowadays is near um, Charleston, Paris Island, and they put up a small uh, camp and they call it Charles Fort. Charles Fort, they leave a small garrison of men, and they are going to head back to France because they have marked their territory. Nouvelle France has been determined. They are going to go back to France, reload, get more colonists, complete their mission. So that is exactly what happens next. But wait, we'll leave 30 or so guys here in Charles Fort. You guys just wait. Hold on. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. The flight is direct. <laughs> And there's non-stop on the way back, right? So that is exactly what happens. So here is an example, or here is a picture of the map of a Ribo coming to uh, La Caroline, and then heading up to Charles Fort, and then he would have head, headed back to France. But when he gets back to France, unfortunately, he doesn't get a grand homecoming. There's no ticker tape parade for our friend Jean Ribo. Uh, France has really erupted in some horrific religious wars, uh, civil wars at this time, particularly in the hometown of Ribot. 
So he flees to London. And here's an aside that I've learned and I'm going to pursue reading more, but apparently it wasn't considered wrong or cowardly to flee for French, uh, Frenchmen in military situations. So fleeing is, doesn't have the same connotation that we might take fleeing today. Um, okay, back on target. So he flees to London thinking, well, I will, I will work with the Protestants in London and uh, maybe we can come up with some kind of plan. Well, instead, he is enchained uh, or in, um, imprisoned in the tower by Queen Elizabeth I. You know, the one famous for the white makeup? So, so he's in the tower instead of being welcomed by fellow Protestants. This is where I get to connect the dots. And if anybody is uh, fascinated by royalty of the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, um, you know my pain. Because <laughs> it gets really complicated. It's a very, very complicated web that they have woven. But for this story, I just want to point out, here's Philip II, Felipe. This is Philip II of Spain. Philip II of Spain is Catholic. His father was the Holy Roman Emperor. Arguably the most powerful king in all of European history, short that of Charlemagne. His son doesn't get the Holy Roman Empire, but he gets all of the other stuff. So, he is devoutly Catholic. He marries Mary. Mary Tudor. Mary Tudor is the daughter of Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII. She is also devoutly Catholic and brings, tries to force the Catholic faith back into England. She wants a child, an heir, and she wants to do it the proper Catholic way, and that is to determine to marry another Catholic royal so they can have a Catholic offspring and maintain the Catholic legacy in England. So these two wed. That makes for a really fun Christmas dinner, <laughs> right? Because your in-laws are now Henry VIII, Catherine of Aragon, who was not beheaded, by the way, for those of you who are new to this story. Uh, she was simply divorced. <laughs> and, and then it also makes his half-sister-in-law Elizabeth. So that makes sense why Elizabeth might have thrown Ribot into the jail cell. It also makes a little bit of sense why Philip is so notoriously violent against Catholic or against Protestants. Was this in the 1600s? Yes, ma'am. This is still in 1563. Ooh. Yes, yes. Henry VIII said, by the way, yeah, past his prime. But um, and so now we are in 1564. Huh. A peace has broken out in France. Thank goodness. Back to plan. Let's get back to Florida, let's get some gold, let's get our colonists out. So, in 1564, 300 colonists return to La Florida. Laudonaire is now in charge because Ribot's busy in jail writing a book. <laughs> he, he really did write a book, <laughs> thank goodness. We have some account. Um, but he is sent to France. I'm, I'm sorry, he's sent to New France, so he's sent to La Florida. This time, really and truly, with the intention to fully, permanently colonize. And how do we know that that's their intention? Because the ships were outfitted. They have three ships outfitted with munitions, agricultural equipment, livestock, supplies, and women. <laughs> Come on, the French. The French. No, and women, because the families, right? So this kind of blows your mind about the whole Virginia Dare and Jamestown and first child born in North America and blah, blah. I mean, you get 300 French people, including women, on a boat coming to Florida. Someone got pregnant on the way, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Um, so they leave in April and they arrive in June. They are greeted by a Tamuqua leader. And they find, at least uh, Laudonaire says, that they found um, the post, and it was decorated, and they were celebrated and welcomed by the Tamiqua. Um, so 
Fort Caroline begins to be built. They name the land La Caroline in honor of Charles IX. And uh, I have an uh, image here, the artist's rendering, um, based on an etching of what uh, building that fort might look like. Hopes are so high. The people like us. It's June. It's still good weather. We're going to build this fort. Life is good. Peace back in France. What could go wrong? Well, the year continues on, and the good luck doesn't hold. Fort Caroline is uh, getting very difficult uh, turns of events. And that meaning they are having difficult with their food sources, uh, of which they preserve. Uh, some, uh, there was some fire. Uh, the food sources are scarce. They didn't plant the right foods at the right time. It was very challenging. And the Tamuqua, uh, the relationship started to break down and the Tumiqua were not as supportive as they were in the very beginning. So, some of the men decided to take small boats and go down in some of those waterways because Florida is not rich in minerals, but boy, is it rich in waterways. And if they go down and they start pirating, because you know, what's a hungry guy supposed to do, right? Take from others. So they go down and they start pirating. And Laudner did not like this. He was a prim and proper leader, not on my watch, don't do this kind of thing, but they did it anyway. So after almost a full year of being in Fort Caroline, it had been determined by Laudner that it is time for us to abandon our fort. We cannot continue to live like this. We will go back to France and figure it out. So as they were getting the ship together and they were about to leave, really got all their suitcases packed and ready to head out. Who is on the horizon of the Riviere May? Who's out there? It's on my slide, right? <laughs> Rebo! Rebo is out there! You can imagine the sound of the trumpets trumpeting as he comes. I see a ship. It's French. Oh, we're saved. So Rebo comes. And Rebo. Ribot has, um, he is sailing in a three-masted, 32-gunned Trinité, La Trinité, propelled by oars, I don't know, I think I've been her, oars, and a sail, and a fleet of seven ships in total. I mean, come on, that's a way to make an entrance, right? So, um... Alon Nair has spent a year of his life building this fort. These are his men. This is my watch. Who are you, Ribo, coming here to take my job away from me? And Ribo, I'm sure, very dramatically pulled out, but I have sealed orders from the king. I am the leader now. So, is it getting dramatic enough for you? Because it gets worse. <laughs> Philip II issues sealed orders. And I'll read an excerpt. Uh, I particularly like this one. Uh, France has been sent out with a great number of sailors and soldiers with the intent of going to that province. I think Florida was treated you know, a little poorly from the very beginning, right? And uh, that province. You may do everything to defend yourselves and capture the forts that they have built and thrust them from the land, that you may hold it in peace. I think the thrust part was more uh, accurate. And again, Library of Congress, thank God for digitation. digitization. It's so awesome. You can go on there and you can read original papers. I read the original papers of Henry VIII's divorce. They're all up there. It's amazing. Well, that was in the UK, but you know, similar. Okay, so... He gives these orders to a very famous man. If anybody has been to St. Augustine, I know you know of this man. That is Pedro Menendez de Avilés. Uh, Admiral Menendez is famous. He was one of 20 children. So you know he knows how to fight, right? <laughs> he ran away from home at the age of 14 because he knew it, even if they divided up the, royal fa or the noble family's uh, wealth, he wasn't going to get much. So he made his way on the sea, right? Remember what I said? Everybody's a pirate of some sort or another. That is what his life was as a private privateer. 
he got to know King Philip II because he escorted King Philip II to England to marry Mary I. And um, so he was the one who was tapped on the shoulder to take care of these French. And he was happy to do it, one, because of being a loyal Catholic himself and having a notorious um, violent streak himself against Protestants, but he also had lost his son a couple of years earlier, three years earlier, in a shipwreck off of the Florida coast. Mm. So he had hopes that his son Juan was still alive. So he wanted to get there as soon as possible. And to do it on the king's nickel, I am in. Let's go. So he had a combined fleet of more than 15 ships and 1,500 men going from Spain to La Florida. And I'm guessing this guy liked to speed on the freeway as fast as he could because he's known for sailing over there so fast. And it's, it's, it's like August-ish. So he's catching some storm winds on this Gulf Stream. And uh, you know I don't know anything about sailing, but he is able, I do know that he was able to go very, very fast. Maybe a bit too fast. Because around Puerto Rico, there were such bad storms, his fleet broke up. And there were only, uh, and then he was able to go forward, he did not rest, he didn't care, he had to get to La Florida. So he continued as fast as he could until his men were practically mutinous with being exhausted. And that is when he decided to pull over and take a rest. He took a rest, and he brought his priest ashore, and they decided to call this place after the feast of the saint just celebrated, St. Augustine. And while they were in St. Augustine, they turned it into a camp where they could set up a bit of a defense. And they gave thanks and held a full Catholic mass. So there is a bit of the history here in St. Augustine. That was in September 8, 1565, way before Fort Caroline had been built. At least in my opinion, this was way before St. Augustine. St. Augustine wasn't the first, but it's still there, and the stories are always told by the winner. So, which obviously because I'm not speaking French and this is uh, the sister city to Quebec, we know how the story's going to end, right? So I'm not, I'm not a spoiler alert, right? So anyway, so they celebrate, they give thanks, they get a good night's sleep because these men are about to embark on a mission to thrust the French heretics out of La Florida. So, what happens next? It's time. Menendez takes his ship, the San Paleo, and he charges into the mouth of Ribierme. And he is there. And who is there? Ribo. Ribo is unpacking all of the stuff that they brought over. So many of his men are in Fort Caroline at this time. But the two ships come so close together the La Trinité and the San Paleo, they get close together that these men are shouting over the sides of the ships. I imagine they're saying some very pleasant, polite things to one another, and they are claiming that this land has been, is, is here in the name of their kings who have sovereignty over it. And so the Frenchmen, smart as they are, and kind of in the French style, cut the ropes and take off. Okay, because many of their military uh, forces may be on shore. Maybe the men on the ships are the sailors, not the fighters, not the soldiers. And so they take off, and the San Paleo cannot keep up. So it goes back down south towards St. Augustine, regroup, and figure it out. And because the San Paleo is way too close, according to Laudonaire, to sail into where Fort Caroline is because of the low tides and things like that. So next time you're at the beach watching the low tide, you have something to think about, right? Imagine that. Um, so it's on, though. It is on. The two have exchanged words. There's been some gunfire. Uh, it's, it's ready. We're mounting a fight. Whew, you could just imagine Rebo, you know, Rebo. We got to do something about these guys. We're, the best defense is the, a good offense, right? We're going to go. We're going to take this. Uh, uh, we're going to take this Spanish 
group, and we are going to uh, just get rid of the threat. We are going to be the victors. And on paper, if you were doing a little fan duel or something like that, on paper, they are the safe bet. They are the safe bet. And why are they the safe bet? Because um, they have way outman, uh, they can outman, outfleet, outcannon the Spanish. In two short days, he was able to assemble 200 sailors, 400 soldiers, and four ships of the largest ships. So, end of the story, we are all Canadian. <laughs> I know that's a weird stretch, but you get my point. Um, no, as you see this artist depiction right here, it was September. Yeah, what are we all on the watch for in September? <coughs> They did not have, what's his name, the meteorologist from CBS? Yeah, they, they, they didn't have a meteorologist to say, uh, you might want to hold down, hold on, right? And, and although arguably I'm sure the Tamukans probably were laughing <laughs> watching this all happen, like, oh yeah, they're going to be in trouble. Um, so he heads down, he makes his attack, but fate intervenes. All of the French ships are blown off course. The men are, some men are lucky to have survived this storm. But who knows that the storm is hit, and who knows that the ships have gone by? Menendez, right? The Spanish. Menendez is now on the attack. Oh, boy. <laughs> I don't care that it's raining, gentlemen. Strap on your uniform, get your weaponry, and we're walking to Fort Caroline. There's no roads back then. I don't know if you've tried to walk in any of our state parks. If you've gone off trail, you've had a glimpse. Now do that during a hurricane with 15th century uniform on, you got it. Right? So they walk up here about 40 miles. And what do they find? They find a fort, just like Menendez planned. They find a fort that was woefully under um, defended. The people who are there are kind of like the farmers and and a couple of, you know, th those kinds of men and women, and th they don't have much to fight with. Uh, Laudanaire is there. He is the, in charge, and um, he flees. He leaves. So he gets on a ship with a couple of people that he's able to save, and they sail back to France. And the rest of the poor souls that are at Fort Caroline, they are murdered. They are part of taking. They are part of the thrusting out of uh, La Florida that the king ordered. I studied Spanish for three years in college, and I was pretty good. But the vowel sound in those last two words make me sound like a doofus. I cannot get them out of my mouth. So if anyone speaks Spanish, please say this properly for me. Okay. Anyone? Sierra, Sierra, Morita. See, it's not an easy, it's not an easy consonant. It's not. Let me say. Please. El que quiere hereje morirá. Mm. You sound like the woman I was trying to copy online. <laughs> and I sounded terrible. So what that means is whoever is a heretic will die. That is Menendez's philosophy. So below the, below the hanging bodies, it is reported that Menendez posts a sign and it says, I do, not, I do this not to as Frenchmen, but as to heretics. So it's not because they're from the country of France, which would make an impact on geoglobal politics, but because they are heretics. Uh, and it also might be his personal um, description. But as the story gets told, particularly by a really amazing um, uh, ranger down at the Fort Caroline Memorial, they were just brutally slaughtered. They were hung by trees. They, were, they may have been disemboweled. They may have been just, like, just brutal, just horrible. Um, so this would have been a, a, just a murderous scene. But the Spanish take Fort Caroline. It is the end of the French Fort Caroline. It becomes the Spanish San Mateo, right? So 
That's not the end of the massacre. That is not the end of the massacre. And my notes are out of order, but that's okay. I can do this from memory. So that's not the end of the massacre because those men who were shipwrecked, who did survive, they weren't safe because they shipwrecked down closer to where the Spanish were down in St. Augustine. And they were trying to get back to Fort Caroline. They were met or they turned themselves in, depending on the storyteller. They were uh, met by the Spanish. And the Spanish, again, depending on the storyteller, offered them an exchange. The exchange is you give us all of your goods on board. You give us your, uh, your um, cannons. And we will escort you back to Fort Caroline, not telling them that Fort Caroline had been sacked. Mm -hmm. And so they agreed. And they were tied two by two with uh, um, ropes behind their hands, led behind the dune to wait for their uh, passenger ship to go back to Fort Caroline. And they instead are met by the blade. And they are slaughtered one at a time back behind this dune. So. According to Pedro Menendez, to his letters back to King Philip II, I did no such thing. <laughs> so it just depends on who, whose version you hear and you tell. But this area, if you look at a map, or if you drive down to Daytona Beach, or if you find yourself going to, for me, a high school track meet, um, you may be competing against a school named Matanzas High School. Matanzas Bay. And Matanzas... The Spanish for slaughter, right, ma'am? Is it slaughter or massacre? Massacre. Mm. Slaughter. Still to this day. So I think that's kind of telling of what happens there. Um, so adding to the drama of this story, when Ribo was captured and was about to be executed, he was asked, Do you now accept the one true faith? <laughs> And Ribot says no, proclaiming himself a Lutheran and reciting a psalm as he was executed. Makes for a good story. We don't have cell phone video. <laughs> oh, French. It must be revenge, right? Because they did have survivors. There were some survivors. The survivors of Fort Caroline's attack and the attacks that happened down in the Matanzas Inlet area, that kind of area. If you were Catholic or if you had a skill set that Menendez needed in his newly being built Fort Caroline, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, newly being built St. Augustine, then you would have been spared. Maybe you were a carpenter, maybe you had some kind of skill that they needed. So there were French who eventually did make it back to France and tell their story in a relatively short time. But certainly, uh, Laudonnaire was the best at telling this. He wrote a book called Tres Voyages, or Three Voyages, which is still in print. And the translation you can read, I read it. It's, it's fascinating. He tells a lot about the indigenous people here at the time. Um, so those folks did go to the king. We demand retaliation. We demand revenge. We went on the king's order. This wasn't us fleeing for religious persecution reasons. We went because you told us to. Do something. Eventually, a man named Dominique de Gorga, he was the one who led a group over here to exact revenge. Now, it's been three years. Fort Caroline isn't really helpful because St. Augustine's a good 40 miles away. That's a long way, even as a kind of a satellite protection. It's a long way. So they're busy building St. Augustine up and, and all of the history there. But according to Degor, he comes here. He encounters 200 men. He kills them all. And he takes the fort back to proclaim victory for friends. When in actuality, there probably were just a few men in there, and it, they probably ran away before they ever <laughs> were attacked, because they would have seen them coming. Um, but this was, uh, the fort did end up getting rebuilt, only to be abandoned in 69. And France would never again challenge Spain in North America. 
they decided to go, so I'm thinking, as far away from the massacre as they could get because Quebec was founded in 1608-ish, ish, um, as a colony in, in its earliest period. So they went way on the other end of the spectrum. So, uh, this is when I get to talk about storytelling. And as a docent here at the museum, I often have so many questions as to, well, how did this story even come into existence? Especially things from a time period where we don't have a lot of documentation. We certainly don't have photography. Um, so, what I'd like to do is have you imagine, again, put on that time travel cap, and imagine this being recited to you by a Frenchman who survived. Fort Caroline. And this is the poem. Whoever wishes to go to Florida, let him go where I have been and return dry and arid and worn out by rot. For the only good I have brought back is a silvery stick in my hand. But I am safe. I am not defeated. It's time to eat. I die of hunger. Because remember, they were starving to death before Ribot came with his masted ship. And I am sure it is what uh, a literature teacher would say, a metaphor. <laughs> On the opposite side of the spectrum, let's go to the winning team. The winning team is celebrating Pedro Menendez a lot. <laughs> This is from a popular author of the time. His name is Dominique. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the board. Wrong notes. This is uh, La Feliz Victoria, and this is written by a Spanish author of that time, Bartolome Flores. And this title alone is exhausting. Yeah. A newly composed work which recounts the happy victory uh, that God in his infinite goodness and mercy was pleased to give the illustrious Senor Pedro Menendez. So that is how the Spanish popular culture is interpreting what's happening. And so it reads, and to give better notice, I wish to recount the beauty, the loveliness and grandeur of this fertile paradise, its people and nature. It is a new world filled with delights, fresh breezes, and a, variety, a varied painterly scenes, graced with fields and flowers, and birds of a thousand kind. Yeah, he didn't mention the mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the birds. <laughs> exactly. All right, so let's talk about the mysteries that endure. Oh, did I fast forward too fast? Okay, never mind. Um, before we talk about the mysteries, keep you all in suspense. Let's talk about the images that I have been using and that are often used in sometimes not in true context. I didn't talk about this first because I didn't want to take any polish off of the drama apple. Um, but the images were created, and as a former commercial photographer, they were created to sell, right? There are things you can do to make it not look real in order to make it sell to a broader um, audience, a broader audience. And that's what happened here. So we have one of the survivors, Lemoyne, was back in France, and he did have some work that he created as an artist, as a part of the uh, history note takers. And he died unexpectedly and was unable to finish his work. So his wife sold the licensing rights, or whatever variation of that situation would have been in those times, to the equivalent of what nowadays we would call a publishing house, uh, a man named Debray. So he was able to imagine like a printing press back in those days, and forgive me if you already know what etchings are, but the etching would be done on these big metal tablets, rubbed with ink, shmush, and you make a print, right? So he could make lots of prints, create beautiful books that would be bound and that would be sold in bookstores. And uh, there are a few of these original books floating around out there in auction houses. They're very, very valuable. Um, 
But they say, if you read De Laudonnaire's description of the Timucuan, and you look at the images, particularly that of the women, the women look a little bit more like Venus, and some of the Greek and uh, Romanesque paintings, uh, maybe more uh, reminiscent of those uh, styles of art than the intensely athletic, skilled, fast open water swimmers as fast as a man. Uh, uh, Laudonnaire went in great description of how strong the women were. He was very impressed by this. And here they just look so curvaceous in these uh, painting in images. So we know why. And uh, also, the alligator. Can you see the size of this alligator? <laughs> this alligator is bigger than a dragon. So um, yeah, I bet it sold. <laughs> I bet it sold. So there is controversy behind these. And then, of course, if you talk about the cultural implications that these drawings and images might have against indigenous people in all different places in the world, there are controversies involved here, of course. But they are also historically significant because that's the only record we have. It's my understanding from listening to an archaeologist here in North Florida talk, you know, there aren't uh, drawings that we have uh, from the Timucuan people, and, and we just don't have the documentation. So that is why these are still included. Now, they are often taking even further artistic license with them, so if you do your own little research online, you start looking around, keep in mind the background behind these etchings. Now for the mysteries. The mystery is, where was this fort? We don't know. The real and true answer is, we don't know. There have been, I have, and as a docent here, man, I have tried. I have gone down so many rabbit holes trying to figure out who do I believe with this story. There's even been some uh, talk about it having been in somewhere in Georgia. Um, but there is a, a university here in Florida, I don't remember the name, which one did it, but they did an extensive, extensive study based on the primary documentation. And they are quite confident it's very close to where the memorial site is now. But the reality is, is water always wins the game, and it has moved that land in ways that we will never know what landmarks they were pointing to because the landmark is now gone. It's over 450 years ago, right? 16 generations, eight grandpas. It's a long time. But what we do know is we know that La Trinité existed. Why? Because it, in 2016, a treasure hunting ship went looking along that treasure fleet line. And lo and behold, yeah, I said that in context, they found a ship. They found a ship, and that is La Trinité. <coughs> it's exciting. I think this is exciting. The La Trinité from over 450 years ago, they have the cannons that are on it. So it makes me question, did they give all their cannons up? Because it doesn't seem like it. Um, they have the cannons on it. They, uh, there's a, uh, an image of the ship there. So did these guys get stinking rich from everything they found on board the ship? Well, one, we know it wouldn't have had gold on it, right? The story goes that it wouldn't have had gold. Um, but they thought it was a private vessel, so they would be able to keep everything they found. Well, you know the story. Was this a private vessel or was this a war vessel? <coughs> it was a war vessel. You know the story. They were at war with Spain by the king. And in last October, 2023, a United States judge found just that. And one of the attorneys had a good, uh, said in quotes in an article I read about it, when Captain Rebo arrived, France had commanding military strength in Florida. More ships, more soldiers, more cannons than the Spanish. But the loss of La La Trinité and the hundreds of French soldiers and sailors and colonists resulted in the King of France deciding to focus on Canada instead. But if there had not been that hurricane, who knows? So 
Perhaps we'd all be speaking French right now, or at least as a second language, because we are not going to give it up. Um, but no, we're not. This became La Florida, and if you want to hear the rest of that story, come to the next talk in a month. <laughs> <laughs> and I invite you to go to Fort Caroline. I want you to take this little story that you've just heard with your time travel imagination cap on. And I want you to go for a nice long hike. It is a gorgeous property. Go for a nice long hike if you can, or go just straight to Fort Caroline. It is rebuilt in an effort to try to build it as close to what it could have been like. And relive it a little bit, knowing that this is our history, that our little corner of the world had such an influence on the globe, on what was happening everywhere. And how few people know our story, right? So that is our story. It's our story to share. And that is why I invite you to go to Fort Caroline. And like I said, it's a beautiful property. You could spend all day there hiking. But um, with that, that is the end of my talk. I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions. But I, again, thank you for coming to the museum. Thank you for supporting me.